Hey guys, welcome back to the Halicrafters T54 restoration project. When we left off, we had to start working, essentially. Got a decent looking test pattern. However, there was a vertical linearity issue. Now, I didn't have the vertical coupling caps installed that I wanted to use. I used a couple of these guys, which are 0.0047. I found 0.05 microfarad caps in here. In other words, a little more than 10 times as much capacitance. Service info I have calls for 0.03, but I was informed by a viewer that there are revisions that call for 0.05. I restalled, uh, sorry, I restored a similar one, T506 with a wooden cabinet that used 0.03s. It seemed to work fine. So I had ordered up a couple of these guys, these Vima 0.033s from Mauser. Because that's all that's commonly available, readily available from the major distributors. There's only 6,000 volt caps left that they carry, DigiKey and Mauser specifically. I suspect these would work fine, but I would have to install extension leads. We need to go from here to here and from here to here. These are a bit heavy. I could attach extension leads to it, but if I put it in here, that's gonna, <laughs> it's, it's gonna weigh down the leads. I wouldn't want to secure it somehow. Well, I also got a tip from another viewer that there's an eBay seller selling these guys. So I ordered up several. He sells them, I think, three for 20 bucks. These are 0.0336,000 volts, so same specs. But different form factor, axials, and they weigh less. These will be supported well enough by their leads. Date code, 32nd week, 1997. So yeah, it's a bit old, but plastic film cap. Never been used. It should hold up just fine. So let's find out. So I'm going to replace. I already took one out. I'll take this out and I'll install both of these. You see, that takes care of our problem. Now, I was tempted to try observing the waveform with my new scope with my Times 100 Pro, but unfortunately it's only good to 1.5 kilovolts. See, on this side of the lead, we're going to have a sawtooth that's, say, 0 to 300 volts. Should be a nice, very linear ramp, just sharp drop, linear ramp, sharp drop. On this side, we've got around 5,000 volts with that sawtooth superimposed on it. So what I suspect is happening with the capacitance being too small, the waveform's getting distorted as it goes through this cap. So on the low voltage side, where I could safely hook up my scope, it might look fine, it could be distorted on this side. But that probe is only good at 1.5 kilovolts. I just can't attach it there and observe it with uh, the equipment I currently have. But we can try substituting, and if it looks good, then we can just assume that that was the problem. Well, here it is with the new caps. I think maybe it's a little better, but it's definitely stretched more at the top than at the bottom. So, I fired up my scope. Let's take a look at the sawtooth waveform. So, on that side, we have high voltage. On that side, we have low voltage. Now, low voltage being a relative term, the sawtooth waveform is, I think, several hundred volts in amplitude. So, I pulled out my new Times 100 probe. Here it is on the scope. I try to maximize it as much as I can so it fills up the screen. And, yeah, that's a little saggy towards the bottom, isn't it? This line should be as straight as straight can be, and it is not. I poked around a line and looked at Rider's Volume 1, and it does show waveforms, sort of. Now, this is an earlier version of the set that used octal tubes in the IF. But the deflection circuits look pretty darn similar, so I think we're okay. These waveforms are a little sketchy, though. <laughs> they are, well, they look to be hand-drawn, basically. There's a, there's a little inset off page that they were taken with a certain RCA model scope. Okay, but they're obviously not photos of the face of a CRT. Uh, but at any rate, let's see... There is the vertical oscillator, and they do show some waveforms. 
So let's check out these points. So they show an awfully linear sine wave coming, or sorry, sawtooth wave coming out there. And they show some spiky waveforms here, which I don't recall seeing, so... Um, one over here too. Now that could be sync pulses. I'm not sure what those correspond to, but let's poke around and see what we can come up with. I'll show the vertical amp as well. So they show 20 volts coming in. Now it's curious. I noticed that earlier when I looked at this. They do have a bit of a curve to theirs. So if these waveforms basically check out, I think I'm going to call this done. I just noticed that. Oh well, yeah, they weren't using a fancy scope like I have, but um, if they're showing a bit of a curve there. This is low frequency. The limited bandwidth scope they would have used back then could handle something like this. Well, anyway, let's see what we get. Well, I'll tell you, these waveforms look dead on. For example, this should be a little spike there, 50 volts peak to peak. That is exactly what I have. One, two, three, four, five. If I go to where that sawtooth should be, that should be 30 volts. That's what we were looking at earlier. That's what's going into the height control. Amplitude is 10, 20, 30. A little bit higher than it should be. About 33. But it is curved. They do not show it as curved. They show it very straight. So, that's where I'm at. I don't know what else to do. I replaced all the parts. I've swapped out tube. That's just, that's the whole circuit right there. Some handful of film caps. All I could do, I could think to do is swap out some of the film caps and think that these new ones might be bad in some manner. And double check the values I used. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to move on and uh, see if any of you had suggestions. Meanwhile, let's finish checking resistors. I've been warned uh, I may very well find a lot of bad ones up in the IF. And we still have a selenium rectifier on the top side and some old resistors. I want to replace that selenium with a silicon power diode and upgrade those power resistors. Alright, so here's where I'm working. There was a selenium rectifier installed top side like this. Just a single diode. The plus side, that's where the stripe goes on your silicon diode replacement. I had to tack it in place so I wouldn't lose track of where things go, so it goes to that wire. Now where this had been, I installed a terminal strip to give me a place to mount this diode and power resistor. So there are two 18 ohm resistors up here. They have a common connection point down here. One goes off and is in series with this. The other goes down below and it's in series with one of these guys. 6x5 and I think a 25z6. So this has uh, multiple rectifiers. It had a selenium we're replacing with silicon. We have two diodes and two diodes. We have a total of five diodes in this set. Huh, should I increase the resistance? Should I add additional resistance? Maybe. People ask all the time what value resistor should I use. I hear you hear when you replace a selenium with silicon, you gotta add a resistor. Well, it's tough to say because it depends on your inline voltage and the current draw of your device. And usually if you look at the operating specs for something, it'll say input voltage from 105 to 125 which has a direct impact on B-plus because there's no voltage regulation, so it's hard to even say what B-plus is supposed to be often. Anyways, I'm going to start out by just replacing the 18 with the 18, the 18 with an 18. i got two nice new guys. They're larger and higher wattage, so it'll spread out the heat more than the original ones. But also, I'm going to do something else. 
The set has a fuse. Here's where our line comes in. Well, one of the wires goes directly to a fuse holder. The other side goes to ground, the chassis. So they put the fuse on the ground side, which is fine. The current's got to complete the loop. You, normally you'd put it on the switch side, but so be it. That's the way they wired it. But what it does do is give us a great opportunity to install an additional device. We're going to cut this wire and we're going to slip in a CL90 thermistor. What will that do? It'll provide a soft start for the entire set. So these 18 ohm resistors are in rush current limiters, but they're fixed resistance. And they're only in the B plus side. All the tube filaments are wired in series going right to the AC line. There's nothing. There's no buffer. There's no <laughs> in rush current limiter like you'd see in, say, a Motorola VT71. So I'm going to add this guy. You may recall when I first powered this up, some of these tubes, like the 6AL5 in particular, flared up kind of bright. And I noticed the uh, tube down in here in the high voltage box flares up when I power up the set too. I think it's a 6C4. We want to eliminate that. That's going to shorten the life of the tubes potentially. So the CL90 will provide a soft start for the entire set. It'll take a little bit longer to warm up and turn on, but so be it. It's a good trade off. So let's get all this stuff wired up and see how it works. All right, I think it turned out pretty well. Two new 18 ohm resistors. There's our thermistor, our diode, and kept the fuse just as it was. All right, I'll pop the CRT back in and let's see how it works. All right, let's see what effect that thermistor has. I'm going to turn the set on. We want to watch the tube filaments. It should take a little bit longer to warm up than it did before, but we should see less of any bright hot spots. Now, some of these tubes have less shielding. In other words, the filament's more exposed, so they will look brighter. That's okay. We just don't want to see any real bright flare-ups. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Yeah, yeah, that's better. Before that 6AL5 just lit up bright white. And, uh, and same with the 6C4 inside of that high voltage box. And here comes our CRT. So I think it's working pretty darn well. If it wasn't for that slight vertical nonlinearity, which honestly isn't that bad. Let's take a look at it again. You know, I, I don't think it's really that noticeable. Let's put on some actual live video for the first time and try to hook up a speaker and actually see how this set performs with something other than a test pattern. All right, let's give it a try with a broadcast signal. And a speaker hooked up. So this is sound. One, two. Not sure if I'm feeding in channel three or four. Either way, I'm not sure to be getting anything. Let me forget the damn power knob is contrast. That's weird. Let's see, signal source hooked up. Connect it, hook it back up. So it's kind of receiving something. Where to get my test pattern generator, but not this converter box.
There's kind of some sound. Uh, converter box is on channel. Sorry, my test bed generator was on channel four. I think this converter box is on channel three. Seems like maybe channel three isn't so working so well. Uh, I don't know how to easily change the output channel of this converter box. I think it has to have an on screen just menu, which I can't easily do. Huh, sounds even better on channel two. Heck of a home, too. Well, I don't have much else to lose, so there are three trimmer caps for each channel. Let's try this guy. <laughs> You're watching Super Sci-Fi Saturday Night on ETV, and there's something very, very weird going on. Cold trap. The Night Stalker is next. We all know that we need a will. Eventually. How about right now? Trust and Will has taken the process of creating your will. Not bad, not bad. Like while you're lounging on the couch, easy. Trust and Will is designed by attorneys, but customized by you. One question at a time. All documents are state specific, legally valid, and start at just $159. That's not a typo. Find the plan that's right for you at trustandwill.com. On your period, sudden gushes happen. Say goodbye, gush ears. Thanks. All. I gotta say that's playing pretty darn well. Now yeah, I should go through and do the official procedure for setting up each channel, but even in doing it by eye and ear, uh, obviously that's a huge improvement. So what's left? Um, yeah, I haven't completely written off the vertical linearity, but it does seem to be really not that big a deal when you're watching an image. The screen is so small, <laughs> a little bit just little distortions like that uh, are really not noticeable. Um, I do want to tweak that channel three alignment because that's a really common one that people use when they set these sets up. And then there's cleaning the cabinet, detailing it. I did a little bit of cleaning on the knobs. These push-on knobs, especially, get really crusty. I started cleaning a few of them. I soak them in warm laundry detergent, or sorry, dish detergent, and then follow that up with using Novus. The type of plastic they used in these sets, or sorry, for these knobs, just really badly degrades over time. They get this white crust on them. Uh, but it can, it can be cleaned off with a little bit of patience. There's one of the rear knobs. I already cleaned this up a bit. I can't remember if I mentioned this or not, but these, these some of these have a white paint splotch on them. Those do correspond to the over-the-air broadcast channels that were available in the area where the set comes from. So I'll put those back in the right spot. I'm not going to clean the paint off of them. And then there's the cabinet. So I think we'll probably be wrapping this up in the next installment. I'm going to clean this usual uh, Windex and then uh, some Novus number two plastic polish clean up all the knobs do the final tweaks be looking forward to that in the next installment thanks for watching